Good morning. Thank you all for joining us today. I hope you are well rested for this session on sleep. Um, my name is Jackie Foster. I'm from Be The Match, and I will be the moderator for this session today. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing from our speaker on this really important topic. And so this session is designed to be interactive. So um, while Dr. Zhao will be speaking for um, a good period of time, there'll be lots of time for question and answer at the end. Um, and we are recording this, so I will want to make sure that everybody uses a microphone um, to ask their questions, because um, BMT InfoNet will be making these sessions available to people online line um, afterwards so everybody who can't be here today can still learn from from this information so I'd now like to introduce our speaker dr. Eric Zhao um, dr. Zhao is on faculty at the Division of Sleep and Medicine at Harvard Medical School and is an attending psychologist at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and the Boston Children's Hospital dr. Zhao's research focuses on how we can better understand and treat physical and psychological disorders commonly experienced following cancer treatment he has presented his work on sleep disorders and sexual health at international conferences and has published peer review articles extensively in the field of health psychology and behavioral medicine. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Zhao. Good morning, guys. Good morning. It's an absolute pleasure to be here chatting with you. And as was just said, if I have to talk for 45 straight minutes, you will be bored. So please put up your hand. Feel free to ask questions about some of what, all of what we talk about. The more questions you ask, which I suspect other people will have, the funner this will be for everybody, and the sooner you get to lunch, which I always tell Sue, it drives me crazy. I'm usually put in a time like this where I'm the last thing between you guys and lunch. <laughs> And boy, it's a tough spot to be in. So we get to talk about sleep. And sleep is something that I'm willing to bet that the vast majority of you have not had a conversation with your transplant doc, with your primary care doc, with any other provider that you see in your life. And I'm making that bet simply because that's been the experience with almost every post-transplant patient that I've had the privilege of working with. And that is certainly not an indictment on you and not appreciating this issue, but about how little as a field we talk about sleep in general. So hopefully this conversation is the starting point for you rather than the end. Now, I like to ask this question because I'm curious about some of the beliefs and the biases that we all have about sleep, but on average, so forgetting about having to travel to Chicago, having to come here and wake up early, just at home in your regular day-to-day -day life, how many hours of sleep do you think you get on average? Five. Five. Four. Four. Six and seven. Six and seven. Others? Eight to, Eight to ten. You seem very sheepish that you said that. <laughs> Why would you be embarrassed that you get eight to ten hours? Most people that I know don't, they get half that amount. It sounds to be. It's funny that you feel embarrassed that you're actually sleeping more than the rest of us. Are you including naps? In I'm that? including everything. Okay. Absolutely. You get naps. I take naps every day. I have to. Absolutely. We're going to talk about potentially. Sometimes that's fantastic and sometimes it's something that interferes with, with what we want to do with feeling good when we wake up. So there's a good range here. And the reason I ask that, we're actually going to talk a little bit later, but we know that in this country, just not you, but in general, for adults, less than seven hours is not recommended. That's not to say that there aren't people out there who sleep five and feel phenomenal. There are short sleepers out there. But generally, we look at folks who well, should be sleeping somewhere on the order of six and a half, seven, seven and a half, eight, eight and a half, nine, somewhere above seven. And we've actually seen over the past several decades that the percentage of Americans sleeping fewer than seven hours is getting higher and higher. And this is an epidemic of just how our society functions, not necessarily who we are as patients. But moving on from that, we're going to come back to duration. Okay, duration is one element of sleep, 
but it often tends to be the symptom of a larger disorder. And there are a lot of sleep disorders. Because when we think about sleep for the majority of us, we just think about the quantity. You know, are we getting enough? Are we getting a large enough number? But we don't think about all of the different reasons why people may not get enough sleep or why their sleep may actually not be as fulfilling as they want it to be. So there's this terribly boring book that you should not read, but of all of these disorders, I would suspect that in this room, beyond the one that we're gonna talk about the most, which is the most common in folks with GVHD, which is insomnia, all of the others are things that potentially can exist together with insomnia, make it worse, or if you don't have insomnia, in and of itself, make you feel crummy when you wake up in the morning. And these are other ones that we can definitely talk more about, particularly afterwards. Like I said, I'm going to focus on insomnia just because it's the most common one. It doesn't mean it's the only, just the most common. Now, to be diagnosed, it's a really low threshold. And that's the message that I want you to take home from this. Please don't memorize this. It's simply a guide to say, to actually meet the diagnostic criteria, you have to, and again, don't look at this, look at me. I'm gonna tell you what you need to think about. <laughs> you have to take at least 30 minutes or more to fall asleep or uh, be awake for 30 minutes or more in the middle of the night for three nights a week or more, for three months or more. All the other stuff that's up here is essentially what doctors do to make sure that it's not other disorders. Like this can't be explained by another physical health issue. Like for example, if you broke your leg, you were in the hospital for surgery and you didn't fall asleep for 30 minutes, you don't have insomnia, you broke your leg. <laughs> or other things that are irrelevant to what we need to think about. But think about that threshold for us. 30 minutes or night, per night of falling asleep or staying awake in the middle of the night, three nights a week for three months. You don't have to raise your hands here. But I suspect, if the stats are right, at least a quarter of people here in general would meet that criteria, and hopefully more of you guys, which is why you're here talking about sleep. But to meet that bar, hopefully you're thinking, well, what does that mean? I have this disorder. Well, it's actually incredibly impactful on not just how we feel, but our health. So in terms of how common this is generally, this is not in GVHD populations, but in general, we tend to look at this from a clinical perspective as do you have some symptoms or do you have the disorder? Symptoms mean you have some of these struggles. Disorder means you meet all those criteria. And what we see in Canada, in studies in Norway, in studies in Great Britain, in studies in France, studies here in the States, across the board, this is a massive issue for folks who've never had to endure any of the fun medical stuff that you folks have. And those struggles that you've had medically are things that make you more likely to actually develop insomnia disorder. Now, that means realistic, we're talking about one in three people in this country which actually have symptoms. And what does that mean though? Well, you read things like in Reader's Digest. Look at this, what I consider a clickbait article title. You've all seen these, right? Things like America's sleep crisis is making us sick, fat, and stupid. Your job was, well, to click the article so they get the ad views and they get paid, right? And you think, well, this can't be true. This is just some terrible writer, sorry, Beth Winehouse, who wrote this silly thing just to get you to click it. It cannot possibly be true. But let's stop and think about this for a moment. So these are the 10 leading causes of death for adults in the United States. Everything from heart disease down to suicide at number 10. Let's take a look. You probably can't see it if you're sitting at the back. But if you do have the print out there, we look at things from sleep and motor vehicle accidents 
Sleep is an issue for hypertension. Sleep is an issue for diabetes. Sleep is an issue before suicide. Sleep is an issue for you actually developing the common cold. And sleep for cognitive decline and dementia. These are only six. There are many, many more that we can look at. Essentially, what we do is we do a phenomenally good job of checking out eight of the top ten leading causes of death in the country are things that insufficient sleep or poor sleep quality either contributes to making it worse or can cause in and of itself. And then if you're thinking for the population I get to see, which is looking at folks at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, talk about cancer. A couple of years ago, a colleague out at Stanford did a really, really cool study. And what she did was she looked at women who had advanced stage breast cancer. She gave them a, an actigraph, which is a professional grade Fitbit, if you will, that can actually capture sleep-wake. And she measured how these women slept. And she broke them into two categories. One was a category for women who slept well, which was defined, I'm going to use a word that you will hopefully become familiar with, called sleep efficiency. It's a ratio. It's the amount of time that you spend sleeping divided by the time you spend in bed. 100% means your head hits the pillow, you fall asleep, and you wake up with an alarm, and you don't wake up for a second in the middle of the night. No one does that. But 100 is perfect. What she cut everyone off at was 85%, which clinically is what we think of as a threshold, which means folks whose sleep efficiency was below 85%, that means they spent 15% or more of their evening not falling asleep, tossing and turning and feeling frustrated, okay? Just based on that alone, while controlling for all of the other things that may make people sicker, like stage of disease, treatments that they've had, etc. What she looked at was, how long did these women live? The blue is where you presume you would imagine wanting to be. These are the women who were good sleepers. The red were the women who were poor sleepers with that sleep efficiency below 85%. Their takeaway was that if you improve your sleep efficiency, if you're a poor sleeper, by 10%, this could lead to a 32% increase in survival, which is astronomical because the way I think about it is, could you imagine if Pfizer found a drug that could increase survival in women by 32%? If they did, they would be wildly outperforming expectations this quarter for their stock. The FDA would be crazy over something like that. And yet, this is just simply going to bed and sleeping better. Something that fundamental that we do every day has such an impact on our health. However, despite how important this is, it's not something that you guys talk about. It really isn't. So this was a study that they did out in Germany. And what they did was they went to a primary care physician's office, figured out if these patients had insomnia, and figured out whether or not their doctor talked to them about their insomnia. And for 61% of the patients who have severe insomnia, doctor had no idea, none whatsoever. Now I'm going to turn that on everybody here. At your last annual physical, with the man or woman who's responsible for maintaining your overall health, your primary care, did they ask you a single question about your sleep? One person nodded. Are you saying he's your primary care physician? No, I go with him to his appointment. Yeah? yeah? How many questions did he ask you about your sleep? Probably four or five. Good for you. Where do you live? Batavia. Everyone should move to Batavia. <laughs> Take his primary care. That's phenomenal. Because you couldn't see behind you. Did anybody else nod? I saw a lot of shaking heads. Nobody else nodded. So call your doctor and say thank you. <laughs>
But for everyone else here, ask yourself that question, why? How could it be that somebody whose job is it is to make sure that your overall health is good didn't ask you about an activity that you presumably do every single night? They probably asked you about your diet. They asked you if you drank alcohol. They asked you if you did drugs. They asked you if you felt good. They asked you and they checked your blood pressure, your temperature, your weight. Why would they not ask you about sleep? To me, it's incredible that that happens. So let's just say that you are now in Batavia meeting with this man's <laughs> primary care. They figure, okay, there's a sleep problem now. What do you do? You end up in a situation where likely you're asking, well, do we think about medication as an option or do we think about therapy as an option for our sleep issues? Now, in terms of medication, we know that this is the go-to for most American doctors if you present with a sleep issue. My colleague at Brigham looked at a national survey of American adults and found that one in five Americans within the past 30 days had taken either a prescription medication or something over the counter to help them with sleep. You don't have to raise your hands either here out yourself, but have you in the past month done anything specifically to help you fall asleep or stay asleep? Odds are probably yeah. And the challenge with this is twofold. First, we know that there are consistent risks of taking medications we don't have a phenomenal idea of why, but we do know that whether you take anxiolytic medications repeatedly, so these are things like Ativan, or hypnotic medications, these are things like Ambien, to assist with sleep, this increases your risk of mortality one and a half to two and a half times, which is not a good thing that we should be signing up for in the long term. And this is trial after trial after trial. Then you might say, you know what, Eric, I take melatonin or something over the counter because it's safe. And what I will say is especially melatonin, which is essentially seems like now marketed as almost like a vitamin that you take. It's like vitamin M. You take it for a good sleep health. That's actually the advertisement I hear now. You don't take it because you have a problem with sleep. You take it just like you take your multivitamins every day because you want to promote sleep health. Well, the challenge there is it's actually, as you may know, not regulated by the government, which for some things may be a good thing, for what you ingest, not necessarily. So this group, what they did was they went to a CVS, a Walgreens, a pharmacy, they grabbed a whole bunch of the melatonin that you and I could buy over the counter. And what they said was, let's see what in the heck is in this melatonin. Now, if you can't read it at the back, I'll read it out for you. Melatonin content was found to be highly variable between samples and lots, with no pattern observed between brand, form of supplement, or labeled value. And at the high end, the actual content was almost 500% more than what the label said, and at the low end was 75% less than what the label said. And at the bottom, the line reads, serotonin was found in eight of the 30 samples, which is about 20 some odd percent, which makes sense, seeing as how serotonin is a precursor chemically to melatonin, but for those of you that may be on, say, an SSRI for depression, or you're just ingesting all the serotonin for fun, and I hope that your doctor knows about it, but presumably not, because, of course, it's not on the drug label. So this isn't to say that melatonin is bad, nor is it to say that prescription medications for sleep are bad. Please don't take that away from this talk. It's to say that there is a time and a place and a role for each of these as long as they are delivered thoughtfully. Now, two slides ago I said to you that there were 
two issues related to the use of prescription or over-the-counter medications for sleep. This is the first. For some, particularly prescribed, there's safety data that is concerning. Second, for over-the-counter stuff, there's quality data, which is concerning. But the second issue that I have is that both of these mask the symptom. They don't cure the disorder. Meaning, if you take melatonin and it works beautifully and you go to bed and you fall asleep every night, if you're prescribed an Ambien, you take it, 26 minutes later you're knocked out and you love that feeling, that's fantastic, but what happens if you have to stop? Well, if you're like many Americans, if you terminate that medication, that over-the-counter, your sleep is back where you began. That, to me, is the bigger issue, actually, which is why, not surprisingly, the American College of Physicians, two years ago, published a st their statement, their clinical guideline on how do we manage insomnia in adults. And their first recommendation is that they recommend that all adult patients receive what is called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia if you have insomnia. This is not with medication. This is not if medication fails. This is if you come into my office, this is what we should be talking about, not the other stuff, which we can get to later. Now, do folks here know what CBTI or cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia is? Okay, good. If you did, I would say, well, you didn't have to waste the past 30 minutes listening to me. <laughs> now, for many of the patients that I get to see, when they hear therapy, they think an old man, a couch, and we chat about things like your mother, <laughs> maybe whether your wife loves you. But you know what? The way that I want you to reshape what you think about CBTI is it is a very specific tool. It borrows the same first three letters, CBT, as you might hear for depression, anxiety, PTSD, alcohol dependence. The first three letters are the same, but the last one makes all the difference. Okay? In this case, the CBTI means that what we do is very different than somebody who's depressed which means when you are out there trying to find somebody to help you with this, if they just say, yes, I do CBT, and I don't know what to do with the I, that's not the right person for you. Now, if you just go online and Google, what in the heck is this CBTI business? There's a number of ingredients, and in whether you read the Mayo Clinic's website, whether you go to the American Academy of Sleep Medicine's website, or whether... You're just on Wikipedia reading about this, which the Wikipedia article is actually surprisingly good. There are different pieces that they mention, but the five core ones that regardless of where you look and who you talk to that comprise treatment are stimulus control, sleep restriction, sleep hygiene, cognitive therapy, and relaxation. I want to talk briefly about each of them so you understand what it looks like. The fundamental underlying premise that if you hear nothing about all of these individual ingredients that I talk about, the fundamental overarching principle of all of this work is not to worry about how you sleep tonight or how you feel tomorrow. It's about changing the goal to being you sleeping well in a month or two months, not how did I do yesterday? And you'll understand why shortly. So first, what you want to do is collect data. And I say to everybody who comes and sees me, we do an evaluation, and then I send them home to do diaries, which you'll see. They say, well, why can't we get started today? And I'd say, well, this is about as silly as you going to see an oncologist and not getting a scan. Because then what are they doing? In this case, we want to understand what your sleep looks like. And if you're like a normal human being who didn't tell themselves, I have to remember how I slept three days ago, you forget. And our memory plays tricks on us. So folks often ask, can I use my Apple Watch? Can I use my Fitbit? 
And the answer is presently, we don't know. There are so many of these devices that are being produced every year that researchers, which are were often years behind the curve, that they try to compare it to see if it actually measures sleep. Some do a good job, some don't. And sometimes they discontinue a model which did a good job, so it's just, it's a real crapshoot. So what I say to patients is often, this is entertainment. It's not good enough for us to trust it just yet, maybe in a few years, but not yet. And instead of spending $300 on an Apple Watch, well, I'll print out for free whole bunch of paper. And this is how you end up tracking your sleep. It's a simple sleep diary. Whether it's a visual one where you shade in when you sleep, or it's a written one where you document when you go to bed, how long it took you to fall asleep, etc. They are both remarkably effective at actually capturing the data I need to then intervene upon your sleep. And I ask patients typically to give me about 10 or 14 days worth of information. So we can see what the waxing and waning pattern of your sleep looks like before we start to fix it. Now the first dose of what treatment looks like, the biggest, heaviest hitter, is sleep restriction. Now, question for the group. We've got Ambien, Clonopin, and Ativan here. What do you think I believe is the best aid to put you to sleep? So what do I think that the best aid to put you to sleep is? A good pill. You sound like that guy who makes the magic pillow. <laughs> a good pillow is a good thing. But the reality is we all know you can spend hundreds of dollars on a good pillow. And if you have insomnia, it don't matter. Sorry for that guy who sells you a $79.99 pillow. This is what I envision is the best sleep aid in the world. For folks here who've ever had to fly on a 6 o'clock flight and had to get up at 3 a.m., what do you think happens at 6.05 when the plane is in the air and you look around the plane with you? People are sleeping, right? Which is insane to me because if you think about it, you are on a plane sitting like this with a complete stranger next to you, but you're actually upright and somehow you manage to sleep. How is that possible? Imagine that tonight I put a perfectly good stranger next to you in bed, but I make you both sit upright and I say good luck sleeping. Are you gonna be able to do that? Why not? Well, you shake your head, you're like, well, this guy's an idiot, how can I sleep? I mean, good looking man right there, what if I put you in bed next to you here? You're not gonna sleep. <laughs> but imagine, now you guys are on a plane tomorrow at 6. One of you will probably fall asleep. It's mind-boggling, but the secret truly is the fact that you are sleep-deprived. That's what sleep restriction does, is the goal is to actually deprive somebody of sleep in the short term so that they learn to sleep during a period that is functional for their life. The way I think about this as an analogy is this. Which brave person here can tell me what their most hated food in the world is? Liver. Liver. Some say lobster? Wow. It's delicious. A little bit of butter. Oh, allergic. Well, that doesn't count. Are you allergic to liver? No. Okay, so you just hate the taste of liver. The texture, okay. Imagine this, for the, for the sake of this thought, everyone here leaves this room and we lock the doors from the outside. As you can see, you have water but no food. And I leave you locked in here for a week. I also take your phone so you can't call the police on me. <laughs> After a week, I open the door and I throw down a plate of uncooked liver. You go, ooh. Do you know what you're going to do a week from now, having not eaten for a week? You're going to eat that liver, and you're going to love every bite of it. It's true. We know this is how we feel. If we're starved for something, it doesn't matter. We have no standards at that point. But when it comes to sleep, that's what sleep restriction is. In the short term, 
It's about restricting sleep so that essentially your body goes to bed and falls asleep and stays asleep in a specific window that again is matched to your life. So essentially if you think about a person during a weekday, this was their problem, right? They go to bed at nine, they want to fall asleep, but they wake up in the middle of the night. They wake up at six or something to go to work. They come home on Friday night. They take a nap because they didn't sleep well the night before. They still go to bed because they want to go to bed early and fall asleep early. But of course, they don't fall asleep until almost midnight because they're watching Netflix. And then they stay in bed late because they get to sleep in. It's a Saturday and a Sunday. But of course, Sunday night into Monday, they're back to the grind. So the goal for sleep restriction is to create that window where essentially we're filling in that gap in the middle of the night to get consolidated sleep first as a goal. Not sufficient sleep, consolidated sleep. The second goal is stimulus control, which is using your bed for nothing other than sleep or sex. Now, for most of us, we think about things like getting off of our iPhones in bed. Yes, that is bad for you. Not reading a bed, also not great for you. And the reason is because, think about anyone here have a dog? Did your dog pee on your bed? I hope not. <laughs> How did you train that dog, which has no idea that the bed is a place which you spent thousands of dollars on a fancy mattress, that it shouldn't go pee on it? Your dog is a genius. <laughs> For most of us, there would have been an event where you trained the dog to go use the bathroom outside or wherever. That's just conditioning. What do you think you condition your body to do in bed if you go to bed and you lay there for an hour and don't sleep? If you wake up in the middle of the night and you spend an hour watching a movie, you teach your body through repeated conditioning. This is a place for not sleep. And here's the thing. We think about this stuff, which again, I agree with fully, but the worst thing that you can do is try to sleep in bed. Anybody here ever tried to sleep in bed? If you have insomnia, you have tried for hours to sleep in bed. You lay there at 3.30, and you're like, if I just turn over this way, and I plug my ears, and I pull the cup, it'll be the perfect position. And it never happens. Trying to sleep at 3 a.m. is actually no different than trying to sleep now. And I'm going to prove that to you guys. So I will give anybody here who can fall asleep in the next five minutes a hundred bucks. Well, you're laughing, but nobody even lay down. Now, either nobody here believes I have a hundred dollars or you recognize how ludicrous of an idea it is to try to sleep when you're not sleepy. But that's actually, as I mentioned, precisely the same phenomenon you try to do at 3 a.m. You lay there willing yourself to sleep, and the reality is it's just like now. You're not sleepy. You would only be sleepy if you waited long enough since the last sleep period that you had, and it was at about the right time of day. So there's a circadian preference in there, and also a, am I really that hungry for sleep? It's kind of like hunger, actually. If you just had lunch, could I give you a steak and eat it? No. You would say, this is stupid, I just ate lunch, I'm not full. But you don't worry that you're not going to be hungry again, because you just wait six hours and you'll be hungry again. Sleep is the same way. So at 3 a.m., don't try to sleep, get out of bed, enjoy your day. Sleep hygiene is the third element. This is something that likely comprised many of the Google eh, can't sleep, what can I do lists. And they're all things that matter. But I mention it third because it's kind of at the bottom end for most of us about what we can do to improve our sleep. Because we've often tried many of these things. What I tell folks is do them reliably and consistently and they're going to be like the cherry or the icing on the cake. 
They're going to make it better. But this in and of itself is unlikely to be the reason for many of you why you can't sleep. So things like getting rid of a bedroom clock so it doesn't cause anxiety. Having some exercise late in the afternoon. Not to tire you out, actually. It's actually meant to increase your core body temperature because as you go into sleep, you notice that your body temperature dips. And that occurs if we exercise like a pendulum. Our body temperature goes up, and about six to eight hours later, it cools beyond our normal temperature. So that's why we want to do it in the late afternoon, early evening, avoiding things like stimulants, like caffeine, late in the day, having a light bedtime snack if you struggle with staying asleep, reducing liquor consumption, uh, liquid consumption, I'm sorry, before bed, so you don't get up to urinate, and reducing electronics. These are all good things for you, but like I said, in and of itself, likely insufficient. The fourth piece is cognitive therapy. So many of us, if we struggle with sleep, say things to ourselves like, if I don't sleep well tonight, how in the world am I going to be able to function tomorrow, go to work, do this with the kids, whatever the case might be? And the reality is, you know what that just did? Is it just put a whole lot of pressure on you having to fall asleep. If we come back to the idea of waking up to catch an early morning flight, you know you set your alarm for 3.30 a.m., it's 9.30, you're staring at a clock going, oh my God, I have to wake up in six hours. I have to get to sleep now. And of course what happens if you're like me is it's 12.30, you're still staring at the clock going, oh my God, I have to wake up in three hours now. I'm never going to get any sleep. That pressure, nothing else changed, but that pressure to sleep started your brain, increased arousal, now you can't sleep. Also, this has to stop my cold, my blah, 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 whatever illness you have. It's going to come back if I don't sleep. Or just there's so much going on in my mind. I've got all these racing thoughts. I will never, ever be able to fall asleep. But these are all things with cognitive therapy we work on. Also, we talk about setting expectations. So I mentioned earlier that sleep duration is one element of this work. And if we look at this, the dark blue is probably like 70% of us, the amount of sleep that we should be getting. But the turquoise is for like another 20% of us. So like if you're the adult or older adult range, somewhere between 5 and 10 hours, that's a huge range. And yet, well, the media, often your primary care, they tell you you need 8, tends to be the number I hear a lot, which is total hogwash. One of us might need 8, but the person sitting next to you doesn't need 8. So it's very American to think that more is better. And in this case with sleep, you know, more is not better. It's like food. You don't want more food. You just want better quality food. And in this case, it's the same with sleep. Getting the right amount of sleep is right for you, not more sleep. More does not equate to better. And finally, it's about working with folks to remind them that sleep is a very complicated issue. It occurs in the context of things like a medical illness, whether you got into an argument with your spouse, whether the bears won last night or lost. These are truly all things that impact and impair sleep that we tend to start to attribute, oh, you know, it's just sleep, when in reality it's all this other stuff that might also affect it at the same time. Now, in terms of finding somebody to do a more thorough job of actually doing this work with you. This is a heat map of providers who do CBTI in the States. If you happen to live in the Chicago area, there's a large number of people I can refer you to. But of course, if you happen to live in South Dakota, not such a great hotbed for this, unfortunately. Now, you can go to the Behavioral Sleep Medicine website where there's a listing of providers depending on the state that you live in, if you aren't local. Alternatively, if you're one of those people that your doctor says, hey, you know what, Jane, you need to lose 10 pounds to lower your, say, diabetes risk, and you come back six months later if you lost 20 pounds, then these books are perfect for you. They will talk you through everything that we've talked about today and walk you through it with specific uh, instructions and also places where you fill out your diary and you put in that information. They're wonderful. These two are computer-based programs that are currently not available, but I have them here because I want you to be aware 
that at least one of them is going through FDA regulations so that you can actually bill your insurance to pay you to actually access it. They're not going to call it shut-eye anymore. But I believe if you go on the Shadow website, you should be able to subscribe to getting updates about it. So right now you have to be a part of a research trial, but it's in the pipelines for you to be able to do this work by yourself. Thank you guys for your time. What questions can I answer for you? Great, thank you. And so we are recording this session, so I'll bring mics to people who have questions. Have a question? In general, I'll sleep about seven hours. And I have sleep apnea, so I have a machine and all that stuff. Good. But uh, I sometimes feel like I'm, uh, like I wake up and I'm in sort of still a kind of a deep rest, but I'm like my mind is going and I'm thinking these thoughts and I know I'm awake and it can go on for sometimes just minutes and sometimes like an hour. Then I'll fall back asleep. Is this in the middle of the night? Yes, Big it can be in the middle. And do you know that it can go on for hours, as in you've looked at the clock, or do you just feel that is the case? Well, I try to avoid looking at the clock. Yeah. So, but, um, but yes, I think, I think I'm fairly aware that it can be a longer time. It does, doesn't happen a lot. I mean, it happens a lot, but not for the long time. Usually it's just maybe for uh, five, ten minutes or something. Okay. So you look like you're about 35 years old. So for a 35-year-old man... We actually know that as we age, the number of times that good sleepers wake up and experience these temporary transitions in and out of wakefulness where your brain might be active and then you shut down again, increases. So for somebody in their 30s, it may be the case that they wake up, good sleepers, mind you, one or two times a night. By their 40s, that might be like two times a night, maybe three. By their 50s, it might be two or three times a night. By the 60s, 70s, and 80s, it might be three or four times a night. And you can still be a good sleeper even though you experience these brief transitions in and out of sleep. It's absolutely not the case. And we have this myth that you have to go to bed and never wake up for a split second, otherwise you're a bad sleeper, and that's not true. However, if your wakings are extended, like truly you've measured, like you looked at a clock and you know, 30, 40, 50 minutes, and they occur frequently, like multiple times per week, that's where I would be concerned. But if it happens once a month, I would say life is great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. What is REM sleep? You hear a lot about REM sleep. Yeah. A deep or whatever it is. What is it? So REM sleep is not deep sleep. It's actually the opposite of it's deep sleep. Opposite. And REM sleep stands for rapid eye movement sleep. It's what happens when you're sleeping, and because brain activity is firing all over the place, if you look at somebody's eyes during that sleep stage, their eyes almost look like they're fluttering. And so what ends up happening is when we fall asleep, one of the reasons why sleep continuity is so important is we go through a very natural progression where we get into deeper sleep, and then we come back into REM sleep, and then we go into deeper sleep, and then we keep doing these cycles over the course of the evening. And REM sleep, actually, that period gets longer as the evening progresses. Now, that's important because if your sleep is constantly fragmented, it means that folks actually may not be able to get into REM sleep because it's the last stage. And so it may be disruptive to how they feel the next day. So that's why we see people who are consistently sleep deprived or folks whose sleep is constantly interrupted, like if they have apnea that they're not treating, that they actually dive into REM, like they fall into REM sleep much quicker. And because REM sleep is longer towards the end of the evening, that's actually why you tend to have more dreams closer to when you wake up than when you fall asleep. But the good or the bad news is you can't really do too much to control how your body does sleep staging. Things like alcohol use, which impacts this, drug use, etc., of course can affect this. But if you are going to bed sleeping well, waking up feeling rested, then the amount of REM sleep that you get is just kind of it. Good to know. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I'm a social worker in an outpatient um, bone marrow transplant clinic, and Great. one of the things that I've been here, I was very surprised to hear, um, I've been there for about four months, so I was in the inpatient side for several years, 
um, patients coming and saying that um, they're waking up the same times that they were woken up overnight while they were in the hospital. Yep. And when I discussed it with the nurse practitioners, I hear, yeah, that goes on for a few months. And, you know, it's kind of to be expected. Yep. But we've got this patient population that's suffering from significant fatigue in addition to all these other disturbances. Is there any recommendation in yes. terms of how to help? So have if you're talking about months after the fact, at that point, it's not because of medication, because of the fact that the nurse came in to do a vitals check. It's not the etiology of something medical. Mm -hmm. At that point, it's actually a learned circadian event. It would be the equivalent, and I'll share a personal story. So I did an externship at the VA. This was when I was in graduate school, and I used to stay up until like 2 a.m. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Going to the VA for any of those you who have to have appointments at the VA, they start their day really early. So with my commute, I was waking up at 5. I'll tell you what, that 2 a.m. going to bed stopped really quickly. It's learned. In this case, I adjusted where my sleep landed because of what I had to do. In your patient's case, because they may have been woken at the same time in the hospital during treatment, their body's actually learned. This is a time to be awake and alert and to do stuff. They often tend to actually tack on activities during that time if it's extended. I've had a number of patients who started eating at that time or going on their phone at that time because, well, they're up and they might as well do something. Mm -hmm. So they've actually created all these associations along with that event. So what you can do with that is actually to start to really log how this is. Maybe they really are in bed for too long. And that's why they have this opportunity to be up for a half an hour, hour in the middle of the night. But they're simply compensating for that by staying in bed an extra half hour in the morning. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Okay, so I'm the caregiver for my husband, and he suffers with ins insomnia. So he tends to stay up very, very late. Yep. And I encourage him, no matter what time he goes to bed, to get up early so that the following nights he'll be tired enough to go to bed at a, a more reasonable time. Am I just torturing him, or is there some, <laughs> some sense to that? Well, first of all, where is he today? He's at another conference. Ah, all right. Well, you sound like a wonderful partner. And what I would say for him is, for folks, one of the sleep disorders that I talked about was delayed sleep phase. That is a disorder, but people also have internal chronotypes, which is our internal preference. Are we a lark, which means for me, 2 a.m. is an early morning, or am I an owl, which means 2 a.m. is a late night. So larks like to be up early, owls like to be up late. This is just who we are. Perhaps your husband is an owl, and his natural circadian preference is to go to bed at midnight and wake up at 7 o'clock, or whatever the case might be. If that's the case, then you might be punishing him by not letting him land where his natural circadian tendency is. We actually see this issue for high school kids. There's a push to delay school start times for high school kids because naturally, for teens, their circadian phase runs later, but high schools start earlier. In your husband's case, it would be figuring out, well, if we kept the same window of time, but we let you go to bed at 2 a.m. and not 11 p.m., and you woke up 5, 6, 7, 8, whatever, number of hours later consistently, does that feel better? And if it does, that may be a bigger issue than the duration of his sleep, for example. If you are able to wake him up, and let's say that's not the issue, if you wake him up at the same time every day, I would say importantly at the other end, don't let him go to bed and not sleep. Because what often happens is they go to bed, they catch a cat nap here or there, bless you, and they end up getting sufficient sleep so that they've spoiled their appetite for the main course, which is when they really want to sleep. So it's about tracking it, actually, again, and trying to see what ends up happening. And when I say reliable, keeping that wake time, at least 10 days to see what it looks like. Most people don't get there. Most people, after three days, tell their wife, screw it. I'm going to my friend's house and I'm going to sleep. I can't do this anymore. But it's about seeing that through. And like I said, it usually takes four to six days for their sleep to get worse before it gets better. And by about 10 days, you'll see it start to equilibrate. Great. Other questions? So uh, uh, speaking about napping, 
Uh, I had a doctor tell me that if you nap, make sure you do it between, I, I forget exactly, but like 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. And no later, because otherwise it'll mess up your rhythm or, right. your, or your sleep. Is that somewhat true or not? It is somewhat true in the sense that there is, remember I just mentioned that people have different circadian preferences? Creating that bound rule is completely unfair to somebody who is a late person, for example. It is to say, though, and I think you mentioned this earlier about napping, it's about figuring out what works for you. It's about having the sufficient dose so that you can sleep and feel rested and good without it impacting your sleep at night, whether that occurs at 11, at 2, or at 4, varies from person to person. And it's about experimentation. What I tend to tell folks is you do not want to be napping in the 6 to 8 hours before your actual desired bedtime, and you want to limit it. Three-hour naps don't feel good. 30-minute naps, 45-minute naps, tend to be the ones that are restorative, meaning it recharges your battery sufficiently, and it doesn't impair that night. So it's this, it's this careful balance. Now, when I say 30 or 45, again, it's not a rule. It's to say maybe for you it's 15, maybe for you it's 60. But I would try different dosages at different times, and you figure out what creates the least impact on that night and the next day and makes you feel the best that day. Great. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you so much for this thank presentation. Thank you for your time, everybody.